Thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll be starting in just a moment or two. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this online CND sided event, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference entitled UK Nuclear Policies, Proliferation, Not Disarmament. This month, representative of states parties to the treaty, a meeting at the United Nations in New York to assess the state of the treaty. In this session, we will be exploring whether UK policy on nuclear weapons is in line with its NPT commitments. There have been two outputs from the UK so far at the review conference, from Graham Stewart MP, Minister of State in the Foreign Office, and also there is a joint ministerial statement with France and the US. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about these very shortly. So we have a fantastic panel of speakers bringing different perspectives to the discussion. First, we will hear from Ambassador Aidan Liddell, the UK government's permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament. Then we will hear from Dr. Rebecca Johnson, CND Vice President, Director of the Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy and Founding President of ICANN. Then finally, we will turn to Baroness Jenny Jones. Jenny is a Vice Chair of Parliamentary CND and was formerly Deputy Mayor of London and an active member of Mayors for Peace. After the speakers have made their contributions, we will be open for discussion. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and do what you can to put the speakers on the spot. So thank you very much. And Aidan, big welcome. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, great pleasure to uh, great pleasure to be with you. Um, it's, a, it's a pity we're not doing this in person, but I know a lot of you uh, uh, who might otherwise have done haven't been able to, to travel to New York. Um, uh, really, that's been the story of the preparation for this review conference. As you all know, this review conference should have been taking place in the spring of 2020. Um, you all know why uh, we have had to wait so long. Um, I think this conference was postponed four times, um, but we are finally up and running and underway. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you uh, from New York, New York as the head of the UK's delegation uh, to the to the MPT review conference. Now, it, I mean, this is an incredibly important conference uh, in the life of an incredibly important treaty. Um, uh, Graham Stewart, the Minister of State who was here um, uh, spearheading our delegation at the beginning of the week, um, says this is the it, arguably the most important treaty um, ever devised by humanity. It, re it really is that central um, to international peace, security and prosperity. Um, we, we ritually say it's the cornerstone of the international nuclear architecture, but it really is, and it, and it, and it matters. It's been in force for 52 years. Um, in that time, it has, uh, it has limited the spread of nuclear weapons. It is a non-proliferation treaty. That's, that was its, uh, uh primary, uh, primary aim in, in 1968. And it has, it has kept the number of nuclear armed states, uh, in single figures, which, uh, um, you know, at the time I think would have been seen as a, as an almost impossible dream. Um, it has provided the framework in which the five nuclear armed states recognized by the NPT have achieved deep cuts in their nuclear arsenals. We haven't got to zero yet, but we are committed to doing that um, legally. Uh, and, uh, and and we have made great progress, although I know many on this call would, would want us to have gone further faster than we have. And we can discuss, uh, discuss that um, shortly, I'm sure. Um, and the other thing to, to note is that the, the other sort of part of the bargain in 1968 was that the countries, um, uh, the countries with nuclear weapons were also the countries that had the most advanced um, uh, civil nuclear know-how. And part of the bargain was that in exchange for safeguards uh, and verification on countries, uh, non-nuclear weapon states, civil nuclear infrastructure, um, they uh, the, the, the nuclear weapon states would would share um, benefits of, uh, of 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 peaceful uh, of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, and that has happened uh, uh, in 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 very uh, very important in very important ways. <clears throat> 
So what we're here to do um, as the UK delegation is, is, to, is to mark the successes of the treaty over the last 50 years. We are reviewing the implementation of the treaty. Uh, and in our view, the treaty has been and continues to be an enormous success. Um, but that's not to say that the job is done, far from it. Um, and of course, you know, there is there is more work to do on peaceful uses. There is much more work to do on safeguards. The, the regime is not as, as watertight as we would like it to be. And countries like uh, Iran in particular and DPRK have, have shown us uh, that we still need to work harder on that. Um, but of, of course, disarmament is the is the main uh, is the main outstanding issue. And that will, of course, uh, dominate um, uh, dominate discussions at this review conference. Um, the obviously we're meeting at a time of great international tension um in in january when the the last time this review conference was supposed to take place i think there was a sense of optimism in the air uh, cautious optimism nobody was getting carried away or complacent but uh, the new U.S. administration had just agreed with the Russians to extend the New START treaty, so uh, the, the the last real strategic arms arms reduction treaty left uh, left standing. That was seen as a big uh, a, a big uh, a big moment. Uh, the P five leaders had just issued a joint statement uh, on the prevention of nuclear war and avoidance of arms races, and again, that I think was was seen as a very positive signal that actually there was some you know, political momentum behind it. Um, although the Iran file was still difficult, there were you know, active negotiations in Iran with the uh, in Vienna with with the Iranians on on returning everyone to compliance with the JCPOA. Um, so that there, there was there was room for optimism, but of course, you know that uh, that optimism all really evaporated on the twenty fourth of February. And you know, while while we're not here to you know talk about Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine in in the global sense, you know, it is obviously a an assault on the UN Charter and the whole international system. But you know, we're talking about that in the Security Council and elsewhere. For the NPT, it also um, poses some really serious questions. On the one hand, you know, Russia has invaded a a, a non nuclear weapon state to which it gave negative security assurances in in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear. Uh, the nuclear weapons inherited from the Soviet Union. Um, it has invaded a country, uh, albeit with conventional uh, by conventional means, but under the explicit threat of nuclear escalation should other countries get involved. You know, this is this is not the sort of um, behavior that we expect of any state, uh, but certainly not a nuclear weapon state and a permanent member of the Security Council who is supposed, after all, to be one of the guarantors of the of the international system. Um, they have launched armed attacks against nuclear power stations, which is incredibly dangerous. And of course, for a country that went through the Chernobyl uh, trauma um, within uh, within 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 all of our memory, um, having uh, you know the prospect of Zaporizhia and, and Chernobyl itself being shelled and, and occupied and used as a base uh, by 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 Russian troops is is uh, is obviously raises. Um, some pretty nightmarish uh, scenarios. So you know that there are lots of there are lots of reasons why um, not just for the, the sort of the, the overall egregiousness of Russian actions, but but specifically for the NPT, there are lots of reasons why this will obviously all come in. But there are bigger challenges as well. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we know that uh, we know that the world expects faster progress on disarmament. Uh, the UK, I think, has, uh, you know, you, you will challenge me on this, I'm sure, but the UK has a good story to tell on our own track record in disarmament. Um, but the fact remains that, you know, we, we cannot we cannot give up our nuclear weapons and expect the world to be a safer place if we're not doing so at the same time as Russia and China. Russia uh, uh, still have one of the world's biggest nuclear arsenals. They're developing new systems such as you know nuclear powered underwater autonomous drones and all this sort of thing which which are deeply sort of destabilizing go in absolutely the wrong direction china is on track to 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 expand its its arsenal um, china is expanding its arsenal very quickly uh, on track to quadruple it by the year 2030 if uh, if if what we uh, see in the media is is correct because the chinese don't tell us anything in terms of what their capabilities are um, so there, there are some big, there are some big, uh, big challenges. We expect some tough question on on, on AUKUS as well. Um, and again, we can go into that perhaps in the in the discussion. But uh, uh, but we're certainly ready to to sort of to, to answer to answer those. Um, so I mean, you you mentioned the various statements that we issued. So uh, um, uh, Mr. Stewart gave our national statement on on day one uh, in the, in the review conference, and he went over a lot of these issues. Uh, again, not not sparing his words on on Russia and Ukraine, uh, but also not not letting that overshadow what we want to achieve in this uh, in this conference. And that is as the P three um, statement uh, set out. 
um, not only a sort of celebration of what uh, what we achieved over the last 50 years, but a recognition that there is there is more to go and that we all need to work harder. Um, I think for us, obviously, the prospects for um, immediate uh, further progress on 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 cuts in nuclear weapons are pretty slim, given the international environment. Um, but there is more we can do, we think, um, to work on uh, reducing the risk of nuclear weapons use. And that well, it's not the same as disarmament, but for us, it is it is certainly an enabling factor. And the trust and confidence that we can build with the Russians in particular um, is what will get us back to the negotiating table um, to to affect further cuts. So that's that's really important to us. Um, uh, it, it, the other sort of injects that that we have at the beginning of the conference are our national implementation report, and I don't know many many of you will have been invol involved in some of the consultations on that report we've done over the last couple of years, and that really sets out our our, our story on on what we've achieved um, in in implementing the treaty over the last uh, review cycle. Um, but there are a few more working papers which I'd uh, draw your attention to as well. One is the uh, an overall sort of food for thought paper on 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 how you get to a world without nuclear weapons. Um, uh, in our view, it's not through the TPNW. It's not that approach. But you know, people have very reasonably asked us, well, if not that, then what? And our food for thought paper uh, is is uh, is is an attempt to, to to answer that question. Both, you know, a lot of it's very familiar in terms of the short term steps that we might take. But uh, it, for the first time, I think it looks beyond that and you know outline some of the things that we're going to have to think about as we as we get closer to zero and how we actually get to zero. One minute um, left. Thank you. Underpinning that, we have three uh, working papers, each dedicated to the to the three principles uh, of nuclear disarmament, as set out in the uh, previous NPT review conferences: uh, verification, transparency, and irreversibility. Uh, happy to talk about those as well. Um, and then we also have a, a, a new initiative on peaceful uses, and this this really goes beyond energy. I mean, the the debate in in the NPT has often been overshadowed by whether nuclear power generation is a good or a bad thing, and countries have different views on that. In our view, Actually, the conversation on the peaceful use of nuclear energy needs to be much broader than that. Um, you know, we look at the, the the global food crisis, the global health crisis, the global climate crisis. Nuclear technology has a role to play in, in each of them, even without going into power generation. Uh, and we've got a, a, a new proposal for a dialogue to try and you know um, broaden the broaden the conversation on peaceful uses. So that's what we're going in this in this for. I mean, we, we're not we're not unaware of the challenges, but we are optimistic and we are looking for a consensus outcome. Uh, and we think with a, a bit of creativity and uh, political will, we can we can get there. Thanks very much. OK, thanks very much. Aiden. Perfect timing. So that's great. Um, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, I'm really delighted to be sharing uh, this webinar again with Ambassador Little, and I really appreciate your openness in coming and discussing these issues um, because it really does make a difference. And um, <clears throat> and I'm also very pleased uh, to be joining with my uh, uh, former Green Party colleague, Baroness uh, Jenny Jones, um, uh, who uh, I know has worked so hard for so many years, going right back to the the London Assembly on, um, you know, mayors for peace on trying to save our cities from nuclear attacks. And as so many people have said, and you in, indeed have said also, Ambassador Little in the UK uh, statements, uh, which I've spent the last two three uh, days since the NPT started, just looking through. We are at a critical juncture. Uh, the UN Secretary General said this was, we were at a more critical place in terms of nuclear weapons than we've been since uh, the end of the Cold War. Now it was our popular resistance to the new generations of nuclear weapons being brought in from, the, from 1979 with a NATO decision through the, the 1980s by uh, particularly by uh, the Soviet Union as then was and NATO. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're having to relive history because we don't learn from our mistakes. But it was the civil society protests, the CND, the, the European nuclear disarmament uh, movements coming together right across Europe, East and West joining. I remember going across to, to Eastern Europe and, 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 and to Russia and Ukraine for that matter, to discuss what we were trying to do at Greenham Common. I was one of 
those women <laughs> camping outside the US nuclear base, uh, to try to wind back from the brink of nuclear disaster. And it was during the 80s that the first real discussion of nuclear winter from the, the data from the climate, um, um, the, 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 the climate scientists started to be talked about, the international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war. So, and here we are, and we're again having to realize that we are up against the brink. And although there are maybe, you know, over 35,000 fewer nuclear weapons, they're in more hands, they're in nine nuclear armed hands. Uh, and they are also 13,000 is still far too much to destroy the earth over and over and over again. Of course, it would take only about 100 of today's kinds of nuclear weapons, and we would be facing nuclear winter and 2 billion, up to 2 billion starving. So let's put all of this in context. This is a crucial uh, meeting to be having. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been supporting the NPT since I first went to the meetings, trying to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty back in 1994. And, you know, but this is also a different context. Not only do we have a far greater number of the states coming to this NPT um, meeting who are already signed up to the treaty on the non sorry the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and arguing that this provides an, a framework the framework treaty that was always sort of envisaged as being necessary to comply with article 6 so i'm going to pick up some of the the themes you said and 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 talk about three different elements because these are erroneously in my view, but nevertheless called the three pillars of, um, of the NPT, and that is disarmament, non-proliferation, and nuclear energy. And those are also the three structural committees that, that decide on these things. And then if there's time to talk a little bit about what kinds of outcomes. But let me start with, with the nuclear disarmament. And again, I want to thank you for uh, putting out so many working papers, which I thought were really useful to see where the UK now is, but also desperately disappointing on everything except the issue of verification, where I was pleased to see a UK paper, a paper from the Quad, which is US, UK, Sweden and Norway, also Norway put in papers. There's good work being done on verification. But None of you, or at least the UK, the nuclear arms states, were not there in Vienna, where there were some really concrete discussions amongst the states, parties, and observers to the TPNW. And New Zealand had a side event there where they put forward a really crackingly interesting verification analysis and, and research paper with, with proposals together with UNIDIA. And I hope that there can be some cross fertilization and discussions around that. On what the UK is saying on disarmament, I'm sorry, I've heard it so many times. And the truth of the matter is the 2021 integrated review that uh, was supposed to be on, um, you know, nuclear weapons and foreign policy related was actually in the going in the wrong direction. Um, it was going to increase the maximum size of the nuclear arsenal, raising the limit uh, from 180 warheads uh, to 260, which is an increase of 40% uh, if, it's, if it's fulfilled up to that level. Uh, and then absolutely reneging on, uh, on transparency. And that's really dangerous because the UK and, and a number of other states were at the forefront of actually arguing. And the UK has argued in NPT conference that um, we need to have transparency in order to have the kind of stability to have disarmament and non-proliferation. The UK is now saying it's not gonna be transparent about the nuclear arsenal. Then UK violations of, 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 of Article 6 with these kinds of increases. Increasing the nuclear arsenal cannot under any legal definition be considered to be uh, a, a compliance with, with Article 6. 
Uh, and again, it's a it's a rolling back from positions that the UK held even in 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 twenty. Uh, I think it was twenty eighteen and and possibly twenty nineteen as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so we do need more dialogue and more transparency from this government and also from all the nuclear armed states. We've got to be thinking about nuclear possessor states, nuclear armed states. Austria made this really clear in their statement. This is not a world where we can believe that we, are, we still only have to deal with the five that have nuclear weapons. No, we have to deal with all nine nuclear armed states all the possible proliferators, but most of all, actually, the 180 countries whose lives will be shattered, whose food will be destroyed, whose, who will face nuclear winter if any of those nine start launching nuclear weapons and it turns into a nuclear war. And they are the responsible states in the NPT. The UK would like to say it is, but you, the UK is not. So the UK is actually providing... a arguments for proliferators, a justification for more proliferation. And the earth cannot, cannot risk this over again. We have to also be making connections with climate, the other major um, uh, existential threat. And of course, we've just been through pandemic and this was something else that we knew about being a risk. And yet it took us all by surprise or it didn't take us all by surprise, but it seemed to take the governments by surprise. And this is a problem. Climate destruction, we cannot now deny that it is happening all over the world. And yet our governments are doing virtually nothing. And the, to the extent that the UK is taking this on, they're promoting nuclear energy. Now, I'm a believer in very limited peaceful uses of nuclear technologies at present at the level that we have for medicine and a few other reasons but for uh but as i hope that baroness uh, jenny jones is going to talk a little bit more about i do not think in this day and age and particularly seeing how an attack on a nuclear power plant is in effect you know a, a dirty bomb a dirty nuclear bomb that's very very threatening I hope that Jenny will say a little bit more about why nuclear uh, technology for energy is the wrong answer on climate. And I, I, so I won't say more about that unless there's more questions coming back. So um, yeah, so finally, I come to AUKUS very, very briefly because colleagues of ours in the International Physicians for Nuclear, for the Prevention of Nuclear War, um, have put in, um, our, have a, have a um, I think a, a, a meeting about it, but I was also delighted to see that Indonesia has put in working paper, I think it's 67, critiquing this. We, there's also a paper in there from China. This, you know, nuclear propulsion, highly enriched uranium or any uranium-based nuclear propulsion is bonkers in this day and age, but also it lends itself to this war fighting mentality of the long range nuclear submarines, whether armed conventionally. I mean, look at the de desperate destruction of, of Ukraine from what are called conventional weapons. We cannot, we have to put these together. And Article 6 tells us not only to end the, end the nuclear arms race, but to pursue nuclear disarmament and to pursue all those other treaties that will bring us to full disarmament, but I'm not seeing the UK do that at all. I'm doing that, I, you know, we're, we're trying to prevent, uh, you know, prevent explosive that. weapons in, 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 in um, urban areas. We're trying to prevent the new generation of, of cyber warfare and, and um, killer robots. We need the UK to wake up and understand this is a very different security situation. And in engaging with the NPT, we have to look at it fully and holistically. What are the changes that the UK is prepared to make to save the NPT? And that's my question. Thanks very much, Rebecca. That's great. And now over to Baroness Jenny Jones. Welcome, Jenny. Oh, you're muted. I was I was muted before, so it was out of my control. But thank you. Um, 
it's an honor to be on a panel with Ambassador Little and with Rebecca Johnson and with you, Kate. Uh, I, I, am, uh, I come from a different perspective in that uh, I spend my working life watching the government. So I can say that if I have an area of expertise, it's in, gov in, in listening, hearing, and trying to understand the government. And believe me, um, after I've been in the House of Lords uh, for nearly nine years, and after being there for that length of time, I've got a fair idea of what this government is capable of. Um, one of the pleasures about being here with CND is that I spend most of my working life with people who disagree very strongly with what I'm saying. And so being with CND members is, um, is, is a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the state of the nation and then I'll talk about government plans and, and government policy. And I think the state of the nation, we are in a period of the most enormous uncertainty for all sorts of reasons. And one of them, of course, is um, our nuclear capacity. And uh, just just this week, um, the um, the uh, um, sorry, uh, the um, National Security Advisor. Just, uh, I've got so much paperwork here because I was, I, I wrote it quite a rant, uh, which I'm going to try and uh, cut down. Um, the um, the National Security Advisor for Britain, uh, Sir Stephen Lovegrove actually spoke in Washington this week and described the possibility of accidental um, nuclear um, um, weapons um, being fired because of a lack of understanding. And quite honestly, that just added to my trauma about climate change and what's happening with our government, because of course our government is in almost free fall. It's certainly in a, a state of complete chaos at the moment. And what we're seeing is people who of the two um, prime minister contenders, they are each trying to outdo the other in the things that they're saying. And then, of course, we're seeing U-turns. So from a from a, a government point of view, from a House of Lords point of view, we absolutely do not know what's going to happen over the next couple of years. A lot of things that the, the uh, prime ministerial contenders are talking about, they have absolutely no mandate for. And uh, thank God for that, because some of what they're saying is extremely uh, dangerous. Um, for example, um, on their um, on their energy strategy, they um, eventually agreed that atomic energy would form the backbone of the strategy and up to eight new reactors are planned. Now, that is utter folly. It's not only that nuclear power is uh, an extremely unwise um, uh, way to generate any sort of energy. There's, there's issues like the fact that they're all sited uh, by the sea, we're facing sea level rises. Um, then they start talking about, oh, we can build big barriers. Well, great, but um, it's, um, it, it's, going to, it's going to get worse. And then of course, there's the, um, the issue of waste. And we had a bill come through um, just before recess that talks about burying nuclear waste underwater um in in various places and you think really do they not understand the danger that um that it uh, poses to you know to, to ecosystems to humans to to um to the planet and so uh on the issue of nuclear weapons and the fact that we're actually increasing our arsenal now i noticed when rebecca mentioned this um aiden shook his head um, so, well, he's nodding at me now. So perhaps, perhaps that's not true, and that will be fantastic if it's not true. But um, at, at the risk of upsetting Aiden, we do not have a government with a good record on nuclear weapons and actually understanding the MPT and what they are, you know, their their role in this and the fact that we are meant to be bringing our arsenal down to zero, and they apparently are going in the, the wrong way. Um, the UK has constantly touted reductions um, in the size of its nuclear arsenal as evidence of its compliance with the, with, with the NPT obligation, but uh, it, it, it really isn't, and we should all be very worried about that. Um, I don't want to, this is not a, an advertisement for the Green Party, but the Green Party's view is, um, very, very clear. We reject any reliance and any use of nuclear weapons. Um, and it means that we would 
decommission our own nuclear weapons and insist on the removal of US nuclear bases here in Britain. Now, I noticed that Aidan said, um, you know, we can't make any unilateral move towards giving up our weapons, nuclear weapons. Well, yes, we can. Yes, we absolutely can. And Rebecca raised the issue of um, nuclear energy and the fact that there are a few civil society uses for them. Um, I would argue that any nuke, any use of nuclear is a danger. And uh, when we have so many other dangers facing us, particularly that of climate change, then we really don't need any extras. Now, the other, um, the other uh, area I wanted to mention, of course, was biological, um, neurological and, and uh, chemical weapons. We would also reject those. And in a sense, it's all um, it's all wrapped up in this idea that we're still a world power and that we need to be seen as um, as powerful. And we need to um, uh, have this deterrent that clearly is no deterrent, because if somebody wants to fire a nuclear weapon, they will absolutely do so and so our country the UK is now violating its dis disarmament obligations and I don't understand how uh, not reducing your arsenal fits with or, or, or is anything but non-compliance and uh, if we are non-compliant then we open up the opportunities for other countries other the nine that Rebecca was talking about um, actually using you know excuse me, having the same attitude, you know, well, Britain's not reducing, so why, why shouldn't we? So what we are doing, in fact, is making the world more dangerous. And it, it is already incredibly dangerous. And we, we really shouldn't be adding to that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm thrashing around here because I'm so angry about it all. I spend my life in a state of fury listening to the government in the House of Lords. They, um, they come up with with such terrible policies we get bill after bill where um it's badly written it's ill-conceived they've got no idea what they really want to do and uh as as we go through these bills and we improve them we spend hours days nights sometimes improving them we send them back to the commons and they whip out all of our very good amendments and um and uh, send it back unamended so uh, my fury at, the, at this government is you, you, I cannot express how angry. Um, they've also talked, of course, um, the cabinet's talked about new North Sea oil and gas projects and the fact that they are likely to be accelerated. Um, but they do say they're going to limit emissions as much as they possibly can. Well, I would argue that we have to exit fossil fuels. We have to exit nuclear power, fossil fuels. We have to understand that these things are so heavily polluting and so dangerous that we simply can't um can't use them anymore um it um it struck me as the others were talking that um aiden, aiden is very optimistic uh, rebecca is um you know uh, realistic um and i'm thoroughly thoroughly um uh, well, as I say, furious, but also pessimistic about this government, because if they carry on the way they are, they are so untrustworthy and so dangerous um, in so many ways, you know, to, to, to people and planet that um, I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to sit in the House of Lords and not, um, not stand up and shout. Or, I mean, I stand up and shout anyway, but uh, stand up and shout even more. It has been, um, it's been a, uh, we've been waiting a long time for successive governments to do the right thing on the MPT and successive governments haven't done it. And so I would argue that the best thing we can possibly do in a political sense is um, start lobbying uh, Labour. I think lobbying the Conservative Party is a complete waste of time now. It's, it's One minute left, Jenny. It's, um, it, it doesn't know where it is and it's utterly confused. So we have to start lobbying Labour because if Labour is capable of winning the next election, then they are the people who might actually take the M MPT seriously and take us out of this incredibly dangerous situation that we're in at the moment. Thank you, Kate. 
Thanks very much indeed, Jenny. Don't get too pessimistic, Jenny. Don't forget the old saying, pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. So we need to um, be determined to go forward and, and bring about positive change. Uh, right, so I've got a few questions here. Um, I'm going to put a few to the panel. Some of them obviously are uh, pretty much directly to Aidan, but that's fine. <laughs> and then after we've had responses to those, if we have more questions, we can have a, have a second round. So um, first of all, we've got a couple about the arsenal increase. So we've got uh, one. Um, he talked, this is Aid to Aidan, red about reductions in the arsenal um, over the years and about the expansion of other states' arsenals. And of course, that those are uh, correct. But what about the increase announced in the integrated review and also the likely return of US nuclear weapons to RAF Lakenheath? There's that one. Then there's another one on similar type of theme from uh, Tim and Wallace. He's um, representing Scottish CND there at the MPT, and he's um, heard some of the contributions already from you and the minister. Um, and he's saying that you uh, argued that the increase was actually a decrease, given the totals in 1967 were ha higher than they are now. Um, he says that you also told him that the UK has filled its, fulfilled its Article 6 obligations to negotiate in good faith and so on. Can you tell us concretely right now, he says, what negotiations the UK have participated in at which the reduction, let alone elimination of UK nuclear weapons has been on the table? And exactly how is the UK working to achieve this goal? And then another one, um, this is to all of the panel, I think, um, well, particularly Jenny and Rebecca. With so many of the younger generation focused on combating the climate catastrophe, and rightly so, how can we work to mobilise civil society against nuclear proliferation? So that's your uh, three Starting questions, um, Aidan, as some of them are directly for you, really, <laughs> uh, would you like to uh, start off there? And if we try and keep our responses to, you know, moderate length, then we'll have <laughs> for another round. So I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you. I mean, before I actually... Before I take the questions, I just I just want to respond to a couple of things um, that that were that were said um, in the in the discussion. So, I mean, Rebecca challenged the UK to wake up and realise that the security situation had changed. The 2021 integrated review is about 200 pages of the UK saying the security situation has changed and outlining all of the ways in which we think that's the case and what the impact is and what we're going to do about it. Um, that's not just on nuclear weapons, by the way, that's in fact, nuclear weapons is about three pages out of those 200 or so. Um, you know, it's, it's across the whole thing from, you know, whole, whole of society resilience, um, you know, counterterrorism, um, you know, climate, you know, the, 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 there's, there's a lot in there about all, all the different threats that we're facing. So, you know, we, we, we certainly do see the, see the bigger picture ab about this. Um, but specifically on the uh, on on the, on the UK warhead stockpile, first of all, let's get our figures straight. This is this is what I was shaking my head about. So the UK had a stockpile ceiling of two hundred twenty five nuclear warheads. That's the stockpile ceiling we declared. I think it was in twenty in in two thousand and five. Uh, it's the stockpile ceiling we've had for a very long time now. Um, we for a long time we said we had wanted to try and bring that down to 180 by the mid 2020s. We haven't been able to do that, and the and the and the 2021 integrated review sets out exactly why, and I think you'll all understand why. But what we have done is to uh, is 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 I mean that that 225 was what we called a minimum credible deterrent standard. So the idea was that you would have the smallest possible arsenal that would be a credible deterrent to the sort of threats that we face. Now, deterrence, deterrence is, is, is primarily a sort of political and psychological um, strategy. I mean, um, I think it was Rebecca said that it, you know nuclear nuclear weapons aren't a deterrent because if somebody wants to fire a nuclear weapon at you, they will do. That's true. But the whole point of having a nuclear arsenal is that it changes the calculation of somebody who might want to fire a nuclear weapon at you, that it's more likely that they will decide not to because of the consequences they'll face if they do. So, you know, this this is what the sort of credibility point is based on. Now, for many years, we thought that a, a maximum size of our stockpile, and by the way, this is not the number, this is not a target, this is the, the point beyond which we will not go, 
was 225. We no longer believe that to be the case. We believe that to be 260. That gives us the that gives us the flexibility that we need. Now, even if we were to reach 260, which we won't, that's not our target. As I say, that's the maximum beyond which we will not go. We would still have the smallest stockpile of any of the five nuclear weapon states. We'd have a smaller stockpile, I suspect, than some of the non-NPT nuclear weapon states as well. Um, that we 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 are the only nuclear weapon state to have moved to one delivery system. We have four. Trident submarines, they are the only means by which we can deliver our nuclear weapons. All of the other nuclear weapon states have at least an air-based um, deterrent system, uh, a delivery system, and in, in many cases, the uh, sort of short, medium, and long-range nuclear missiles as well. We don't have uh, land-based missiles. We don't have we don't have any of that. So, um, you know, th th these, these figures of 40% of increases are, are just factually incorrect, I'm afraid. Um, so, you know, we, we, we sort of argue from, from, the, from the basis of, 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 of what's actually going on. Now, the second sort of point is about whether this is whether increasing the stockpile cap um, is, is a violation of Article 6 or not. It's not. Article 6 requires us, obligates us to negotiate in good faith on, uh, on measures, effective measures to end the nuclear arms race, to achieve nuclear disarmament, and as Jenny said, um, to achieve uh, in the context of general and complete disarmament. So these things are related to other other you know areas of weaponry, not just in a in a, a bubble on its own. Article six obligates us to negotiate in good faith, and we've done that. Um, to, so to the question on 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 when we have negotiated, uh, we negotiated the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which limits the qualitative development of nuclear weapons. Uh, we are. One of the ones pushing hardest in the conference on the sum to start negotiations on the uh, on a fissile material treaty that would end the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons. So that would end the that would set a quality a quantitative limit on the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, it's Pakistan and China who are blocking that in the CD. It's not us. We we've been arguing for it for for, for more than twenty years now. When I was president of the CD two years ago, I put a proposal on the table to start negotiations, and it was blocked. So, you know, as I say, we can't do this on our own. We have done as much as we can on our own by going to the minimum credible standard. If everybody else did the same, then we would we would be in a position to negotiate on the next step. But uh, but I'm afraid that's 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 not where we that's not where we are today. I'm sorry um, for going on a bit long. No, but, uh, no, that's that's fine. But just before um I turn to Rebecca or Jenny, whoever wants to go next, you you didn't comment on the likely return of US nuclear weapons to RAF Lake. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that is likely. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where that's where that's come from. Um, well, there have been responses in Parliament about that. Maybe I'll send you them afterwards so you'll have to speak. Right. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, all, all, all I can all I can talk about is the UK nuclear arsenal. I mean, that's that's what's that's what's under our control, and that's what's um, you know that's 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 my uh, that's my negotiating mandate. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Um, right, Rebecca or Jenny, who wants to go next? happy to go next yeah go ahead Rebecca yeah thank you for those those questions I'm uh, rather gobsmacked I'm afraid to hear deterrence again being trotted out as if it's something that works and that we can rely on for security and I, I'm you know I wrote a, a working paper in 2016 for the UN uh, open-ended working group which went through all the arguments about why it didn't but it, this time I really just want to quote a couple things on, on the on this point that, that for, you know from the UN Secretary General because I think there's been a lot of papers the Austrians and and the Irish and others have 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 critiqued deterrence also in the just the first three days two and a half days of of the NPT <clears throat> but um uh the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres says, states are seeking false security in stockpiling and spending hundreds of billions of dollars on doomsday weapons that have no place on our planet. He then says, we've been extraordinarily lucky so far. And this is an argument that has been made by Chatham House with their analysis of, 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 of deterrence uh, and all the failures that there have actually been, not just the Cuban Missile Crisis, but over 13. And uh, the Secretary General goes on, but luck is not a strategy, nor is it a shield from geopolitical tensions boiling over into nuclear conflict. Today, humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. And I just wish the UK would, 
would 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 hear that and be making the steps. The other thing I'm gobsmacked about is that on the one hand, you're saying <clears throat> you know that the UK cannot make unilateral steps. The whole unilateral versus multilateral thing was a PR job of the Tory party back in the 80s, picked up by the media. The truth of the matter is that in 2000, the NPT review conference consensus final documents, one of the few that there have been, um, made very clear the obligation to take unilateral, bilateral, plurilateral, meaning at that time among all of the nuclear or all or some of the nuclear armed states and multilateral steps. It's not either or, it's all of those ones as they, you know, as much as can be done. That's the only way to make progress. <clears throat> TPNW was based very much, in fact, some of the leadership in the TPNW with the, the new gender coalition states that um, that got that plan of action in 2000 that the UK joined consensus on and it's still part of, of the NPT obligations, um, that, uh, that, that what the TPNW would do would be actually to provide the, the principles, the objectives and the ways and means unilaterally, bilaterally, um, uh, plurilaterally and, and multilaterally for the whole of the world to have a role to play in bringing to nuclear disarmament. It's not just a job for nuclear armed states, it's a job for everybody. The nuclear armed states should have been there in Vienna. Um, and um, yeah, so, so just, you know, we cannot keep relying on this completely incredible uh, idea of deterrence when one, and nor can we keep boasting we've got the smallest arsenal. I'm sorry, but compared with 180 something countries that have chosen not to develop nuclear arsenals, we've got a massive one. One Vanguard Trident submarine going to sea, supposedly on its, 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 its continuous at sea deterrent patrols. If it gets the order, or indeed, if there's a cyber attack that means that an order is delivered to that uh, submarine at sea, the, the weapons on board of that could, if, if fired at just five or six major cities, and the, the, the studies have been done major Russian cities, uh, would actually precipitate through the dust clouds and the fires and all sorts of things like that, the nuclear winter. So we really need to wake up that. And in waking up that, I'll, make, I'll answer that final the, the, the question to me, which I really liked, which was what can we do to, to, to kind of get the next generation going? The next generation actually really is now going on the nuclear weapons issue through all the networks of ICANN all around the world. I mean, more than... Uh, 450 <laughs> uh, in 100 countries. We have at the MSP. We deliberately were bringing young people in from all over, all over the world, and 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 including particularly Scotland and and the UK, and sometimes, you know, our own organisations helping to pay for that. And also, I'm really glad that they're connecting climate and militarism, because the fact is that climate destruction causes war, will cause war, is causing horrendous con conflicts already, or is at least contributing to them. And of course, nuclear weapons causes a massive climate destructive um, uh, risk uh, that, that isn't the answer to global heating, because what it actually does is, is it, it causes even more massive disruption. We have to put those together. I'm increasingly being asked to meetings with young activists from XR and XR piece around the country talking about what we know of the military, industrial, uh, nuclear, um, bureaucratic, uh, academic kind of groupthink and how we can move them out of that way because the sad thing is that the UK government, um, you're quite right, IR21 talked about those threats and then came up unfailingly almost with the wrong answers, with, with, with far too great a reliance on the military industrial uh, arms sales all over the world, not just nuclear, but, but fueling you know, the, the, the wars in other places again and again and again. We have to do new thinking and you know, start 
building the British economy on something other than old notions of colonialist, imperialist wars that, that we only just squeaked through, to be perfectly honest, with massive numbers of people okay. you know, harmed and killed in cities and death, from away from that and into building peace, building security with other countries around the world, and really tackling the scourge of all the arms trading and weapons selling. Thanks, Rebecca. Sorry to cut you off, but we've got questions, more questions to come. But first of all, we want to hear from Jenny. Jenny. Thank you. On my machine, it says I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, all right. Well, it's a pleasure to follow um, Rebecca. It's actually said everything I would have said um, and probably said it better. So, um, and she, of course, I don't want to gang up on, on Aiden, although I think he's probably quite quite robust about it. Um, but Rebecca's absolutely right about the whole concept of deterrence. It's a ridiculous, um, outdated notion that if you carry a bigger stick than the next person that, that you can beat them. You know, it, we, we all lose when there's a fight of that kind. And uh, to suggest that we can um, stop others by, by waving our nuclear weapons around is, is folly, of course, because as we've seen, Russia has come apparently quite close to uh, using its nuclear weapons and uh, let's let's hope they don't. Um, on the issue of social mobilization, it's a um, it's obvious that uh, protest has changed quite a lot. I mean there will always be organizations that uh, look to um, do, do the right thing and work through um, legislation and lobbying and things like that. And then there will be the people who get out on the streets and protest. And I've protested a lot. Um, I've only been arrested once. And it, it, there was a slight irony in that I wasn't even part of the protest. I was trying to stop it. But um, we now see people going much further. And, uh, they, and so all of these contribute to pressure on the government. And for them to um, increase penalties for protest and for free speech is absolutely wrong. And uh, we do have a very repressive government that's trying to stop basically anybody who disagrees with them. And so I would say that when it comes to mobilizing young people, I think they are already mobilized. But um, a good thing to do is make sure that we um, we we uh, give them the information that they need because the information is is positively it becomes obvious what the solutions are, and if we can um, you know talk to them at universities, at colleges, even at schools. Um, my own grandchildren are um, extremely political on this, um, and and it's it strikes me that we can. Um, create a whole generation of people who, who actually want the best for everybody. And, and we don't really have that at the moment. We've got a government that talks about leveling up and actually what it's doing is leveling down and increasing the number of people living in poverty and allowing the rich to get richer. And Rebecca was making all these links. Um, all of this is linked. Uh, poli the, the politics of the UK and uh, the way that we uh, we treat our own um, uh, treat our own people, and also climate change, and the fact that our government has completely abandoned its whole net zero program that looks so you know so promising um, that, that they've they've completely dumped that, and so it, it's it's all part of the same thing about linking environmental justice and social justice. And we have to be able to do that. We have to explain where the links are and we have to explain um, what people can do about it. Um, I, um, I bring up these issues in the House of Lords all the time and I get these terrible answers. You can read it all in Hansard. And it's, 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 um, it's almost impossible to make this particular government see the problem. And so I would argue we need another government and if it's going to be Labour, we need to make sure. Am I getting too party political? Um, yeah. Well, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Do, okay. do you mind if I come back in again? I mean, we, we, we've would got a bit. Mind, um, Aiden, would you mind if I just give a few more questions and then you can each well, come I, back and say. I want you to agree you like. with Rebecca about a couple of things. Is that all right? Oh. 
Well, uh, I'm happy not to if you'd, if you'd rather I didn't. Well, could you, could you agree with them in your final comments? All right. OK, sorry about that. It's just otherwise I don't want the voices from the audience to be uh, lost, so to speak. Um, uh, so I'll give you two or three more and then you're free to come back um, in whatever way you like. So um, I've got one which um, touches on essentially on AUKUS. You mentioned that earlier, Aidan, um, and then the kind of peaceful uses of energy thing within, within the uh, MPT. Uh, surely the peaceful uses of nuclear energy cannot possibly include military uses, such as to fuel a military submarine for the Royal Australian Navy. This has nothing to do with whether or not nuclear energy is used directly to kill millions of people, as with a nuclear weapon. Uh, naval submarines designed for convention conventional warfare are not a peaceful purpose by any stretch of the imagination. So if you'd like to comment on uh, AUKUS. Um, then I've got one uh, more directly on the nuclear energy thing. Scientific studies show that nuclear energy is an energy sink. Energy to mine uranium, to refine uranium, energy input for 15 years to build nuclear power stations, energy coming out for 30 years, then energy going in again for decommissioning, energy going in for the next few hundred years to, look, to safely look after the waste. Total energy going in is more than energy coming out. Why does anyone think that nuclear energy is of any use to humankind? And then the final one I'm going to um, give you, um, this is all about um, also about the harms, uh, sort of non-explosion harms of nuclear weapons. UK nuclear weapons have only been possible with enormous harm being done to peoples and lands far from this island through uranium mining and testing. E.g. Trident was tested on the land of the Western Shoshone in Nevada. Whatever you're thinking on nuclear deterrence, you cannot justify harming other peoples for our security. Shouldn't we be more focused on acknowledgement and accountability for harms caused and decommissioning? So um, that's what um, I'm going to put forward to you three. Um, so I turn to you to answer those in any way you wish and to make any concluding remarks. So, Aidan, would you like to go first and then you can pick up on your agreements with Rebecca at the same time? So. All right. You get to hear those, of course. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Um, so, I mean, look, we, we, we're not going to agree on deterrence. Um, you know, we, we the, the UK government and, and successive UK governments over the last 70 years have, have, have believed that our security and that of our allies is best served by uh, by nuclear deterrence. And nuclear deterrence is about avoiding war. It's not about fighting war. Um, and I think actually in, in the case of Ukraine, um, you know, it, it is it, uh, obviously nuclear weapons Nuclear rhetoric has played a part in in Putin's approach to this war, but nuclear weapons have not. Uh, and uh, I think the fact that that the, the the war in Ukraine has not escalated further than it already has, which is horrific enough, um, is is at least part due to the nuclear deterrence. But I think you know we're, we're not going to agree on that. So you know that's 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 just that's just where we are on that. But I think what I wanted to agree with Rebecca on was was two things. One on the question about luck uh, or misjudgment or miscalculation. Um, I mean, we agree with that. I mean, actually, you, you referred to Stephen Lovegrove's speech, and actually that, that's he was talking about the same thing as, as Antonio Guterres was, which is that, you know, you cannot rely on, on luck to, to avoid miscalculation or, 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 or um, misunderstanding. Um, and this is why we've put so much effort into uh, really very difficult and technical discussions amongst the P5 about precisely this we, we you know we call it risk reduction but but you know essentially it is about making sure that we understand each other so that we don't misinterpret each other's signals we don't sort of misunderstand what each other's nuclear doctrines and postures are all about um and that we you know we we we, we make sure that we don't escalate by by accident or or, or sort of go down that path uh, by by misunderstanding so you know we, we we take that very seriously and that's that's something that we're putting a lot of effort into and it's going to be quite a a big discussion i think at this at this review conference indeed i've, I've been at meetings about that uh, this morning um 
the other thing I wanted to agree was agree with you was about the balance between sort of or the, the mix of unilateral and bilateral and plurilateral and multilateral um, pathways. Um, I, I, I didn't say that the only way you can ever affect any reductions is multilaterally. That's not true. And that's not that's not the case in, in our case. All the reductions we have made in our nuclear arsenal have been unilateral ones. They've been ones we've decided to do ourselves. Uh, on the basis of our reading of the security situation and our relations with with the others, um, so you know we, we we can and have made deep cuts through through our own sort of unilateral actions. Um, the the main cuts that the US and Russia have done is through bilateral arms control. What we need to do when when everybody gets down to that sort of level the final step towards a global zero will be multilateral. We're not going to do that unilaterally. Again, you know, we, we're going to agree to disagree on this, but we we do not believe that our security or, or, or NATO security is going to be enhanced by the UK, France and the US giving up its nuclear weapons while Russia and China keep theirs. Um, feel free to disagree with me, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear on that. Um, the three questions that, uh, that, that you um, put to us, um, put to me, sorry, um, AUKUS, uh, I mean, the, the NPT prohibits the transfer of nuclear weapons from nuclear weapon states to non-nuclear weapon states, and it prohibits non-nuclear weapon states from acquiring nuclear weapons or seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. AUKUS is nothing to do with any of that. Naval nuclear propulsion is nothing to do with any of that. Plenty of countries uh, have or, or aspire to have uh, nuclear powered conventionally armed submarines this is this is fairly standard uh it it doesn't come into the NPT at all what 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 matters as far as the NPT is concerned is that when Australia acquires this capability they do so uh in full compliance with their IAEA safeguards agreement so the agency can tell that whatever is happening is in compliance with you with with Australia's um Australia's obligations. We've all three of us been very clear that we're going to work very closely with the IAEA. We ha we've had meetings with Director General Grossi this week on this. We have very, very technical discussions, very tough discussions with the IAEA, and they are very rightly holding us to an extremely high standard. What we hope to do on this is to um is is to make sure that we are setting a precedent that sets the very, very highest standards that improves the standards on, on naval nuclear propulsion. Um, and and, I, and I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to, to do that. Um, on nuclear energy, I mean, again, we, we, we will agree to disagree about nuclear energy. The government's been pretty clear that it sees nuclear power generation as being a, a safe, sustainable uh, power source. I, I know you disagree. Fine. Um, but my, my point for this NPT actually is not... <laughs> is not promoting nuclear power generation per se. Our point here is that we need to raise awareness of the relevance of nuclear derived technology for the SDGs as a whole. So, you know, the PCR tests that we've all been so used to over the last two or three years, they are derived from nuclear technology. The IAEA has played a very, very important role in getting that technology out to developing countries uh, for, for COVID diagnostics. We all know about cancer treatment. Uh, we all know about the sort of uh, nuclear derived technologies that can help us uh, mitigate the damage from climate change that can help with water detection, for example, underground water sources, um, improve the yield of agriculture, this sort of thing. You know, th th this is this is something Thing that that you know we need to we need to talk more about. We need to get people aware of the huge uh, benefits for the SDGs that that these these nuclear derived technologies can have. Again, leaving aside uh, leaving aside power generation because I know there are there are different views on this. But you know, nuclear peaceful nuclear uses is not just about nuclear power generation. I think increasingly will be about much more besides, and I think that's quite exciting. On testing, um, I mean the reason we. With the reason we haven't tested a nuclear weapon since 1991 and the reason why we signed up to a legally binding prohibition on nuclear testing in 1996 is for precisely the reasons that uh, that were set out you know this is uh this is this is something that that we need to we need to end um the only country that's tested a nuclear weapon this century is north korea uh, and the world will not be safe until all the remaining annex two states uh us uh, China, India, Pakistan, and all the rest sign up to the CTVT and it enters it enters into legal force. That's an incredibly important uh, part of the of, of of the road that we're on, and it's something we advocate for very strongly. Again, sorry for being being a bit lengthy. No, that's fine. Thanks very much indeed, Aidan. Jenny, over to you. Thank you. I was going to say that there are a few steps on the way that we could take towards um, unilateral 
um, nuclear disarmament, which is obviously something I would love to see. Um, and so, for example, we constantly sell weapons to other countries, and we seem to do it in a moral vacuum in that we're quite happy to supply Saudi and, and similar appalling regimes with weapons and it's time we absolutely stop doing that and i know that that would be extremely difficult um but it's something we have to do obviously we will probably always export arms in some way or another because of course ukraine is a classic example where we are actually helping them with training and with weapons and it's obvious that if it's part of a, a un you know sanction defense program then there will perhaps be a role for for selling or donating weapons and the other thing that always infuriates me well loads of things infuriate me um is that we still give subsidies to arms exports i do not understand why we would do something like that when um it's clearly just fermenting more and more stress and trouble um, we we do know that a lot of the uh, conflicts in various regions around the world actually do generate a huge number of refugees. We are often responsible in part for the generation of those refugees. And yet we have now drawn up the drawbridge. Um, we we have hardly have any safe routes for refugees. And again, it is a case of um, understanding that everything has an impact on everything else. And personally, um, I would like to see um, uh, our move from uh, the creation, from the manufacture of arms to other peaceful uses for our technology and for our, for our smart, um, smart innovators. And we can do that. It's obviously that a, net, a net zero or low carbon economy is actually fantastically good for jobs. It's good for people and planet, and that's the way that we should be going. Nuclear weapons do not have a role in that. Thanks very much, Jenny. Rebecca, over to you for your concluding remarks. Uh, un unmute, Rebecca. It's the classic one still. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, and and thank you very much um, to, to both the other speakers. So, um, I am very briefly just going to comment on 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 luck because if you understand that luck may run out, how can you, in the context of seeing all of the miscommunications and miscalculations that led into this horrendous war in Ukraine, that and the, and the, and the death toll. How can we believe that somehow risk, uh, you know, management and risk reduction is 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 going to do the trick? Yes, it's a good thing to do. You should have it in all your defense policies. You should have, you know, aspects of of of, of all different kinds of tools. But with nuclear weapons, just one will destroy a city utterly. And uh, as I said, forty fired from UK Vanguard Trident could destroy the world or at least cause massive um, uh, starvation. So we can't we can't do that. This should be a wake up call to get rid. And it, it, it's on a par with, you know, putting our very best brains as went into when we actually faced COVID-19, which was a, a, a threat that was around, was being discussed in certainly some of the security context that I was sitting around discussing with various governments for, for at least two decades. Governments turned a blind eye, didn't put the resources into, it didn't even stockpile the necessary health equipment. But when it hit, best brains went into finding the solution and the vaccinations. Best brains in this country could do that estimated that, that, that the UK's nuclear arsenal could probably be completely dismantled safely and securely in about four years. Now, the TPNW is actually providing a deadline of up to 10 years, and you can ask for an extra five years after that. So let's put all of these things in context. Second point I wanted to make was uh, the, 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 the energy issue. And I just want to draw attention perhaps to the work done by Phil Johnson and uh, Andy Sterling at University of Sussex on exactly that issue about nuclear energy is just a, is a sink. It's, it, if, if this government took everything into account, we would see this is a hugely 
expensive, both in climate terms and in financial terms, expensive form of energy. But I want to devote the, the last remaining couple of minutes that I have to the, the, the question about the harmful impacts. And I saw on the Q&A that this is from Jane Gregory, and I just want to give a, a, a shout out to Jane because she was one of the three Green and women who walked to ground zero and stopped the penultimate UK nuclear weapons test in 1990 as Greenpeace and, and, and others hang, hung a huge banner saying, stop UK nuclear tests. That's why the nuclear tests were stopped in 1991 was to create the space for um, the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And Jane is absolutely right. She spent several days walking across the Western Shoshone land known as the Nevada test site with, with three others to stop that test and uh, has remained in contact with Western Shoshone, a whole group of uh, us from Greenham, remained in, in contact with Western Shoshone. And we need to really reinvigorate the understanding that the nuclear, uh, at every level, the uranium mining to the nuclear production, to the nuclear testing, to any possible use and threat of use, the deployment of nuclear weapons, and also the waste disposal, which the Western Shoshone are now having to deal with. Let's not forget, 45 nuclear weapons tests were done by the UK. 70 years ago was the first one, October 3rd of um, uh, 1952, which happens to be my birthday. The first half were done in the Pacific, destroy the, you know, the, the explosions destroying atolls and islands, Kiribati, you know, so-called Christmas Island, the plutonium trials that utterly destroyed Aboriginal lands in Maralinga. And we are responsible. And then the young uh, service people that were being sent into harm's way. And again, a, sh a shout out for the, for, for the, um, um, Alan Owen and and um, lab rats as, as they're now called, but the the you know the the service, um, the you know the families who are still trying to get some kind of restitution, the TPNW clearly it was founded on humanitarian principles and it goes right through the treaty and Article six and seven. It do exactly what you should be doing. I'd like to see, though, even before the UK government is ready to sign, I recognize it will take a little while, but we have to have this movement pushing and pushing. But I would like to see you taking some steps, even before signing that treaty, to start implementing Article 6 and 7, to start really paying attention to the survivors and their families from the British nuclear weapons, from the Pacific right across to um, uh, the Western Shoshone land in, in the US and work with them on the environmental remediation. W ask them what they need and then start putting some resources into helping the families and the downwinders who are left from Britain's nuclear weapons and to work with them also on making sure that when we do come to dealing with nuclear waste, we're not going to, you know, re-victimize re them all over again. So, but this is our responsibility here in this country. No one else's, it's ours. Even, you know, for those of us who oppose nuclear weapons, it's still our responsibility, this nuclear colonialism and destruction. So I'm glad to have had that question. And I want to leave on that note that because it's our responsibility for all of us, we've got to integrate it into everything we say and do on anything to do with nuclear weapons, other kinds of weapons, and really push for holistic, non-harmful ways to, to tackle uh, climate, the, the, the climate emergency. And I'll end there. Thanks very much indeed, Rebecca. So that brings us to the end of this uh, very, very interesting meeting. Uh, apologies to those of you who put in questions and we haven't had time to answer them, but we very much appreciate that and appreciate your participation. And if you're in New York, I hope you have some more fruitful discussions over the days ahead. So it just remains to me to thank uh, Aidan Little very much for joining us and thank you for being 
a good sport, I suppose one might say. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to Jenny Jones. And um, you're an angry woman, Jenny, but also very, very constructive and, and very dynamic in the cause of peace. So thank you. And as always, a massive thank you to Rebecca Johnson for sharing your passion for action with your uh, great erudition as well. So thanks very much, everyone, and uh, see you all soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for those great questions.